Hi, everybody. Um, before I begin the introduction, there is a file in our Zoom chat that you can download. We advise that you go ahead and download it. And so I am Carl, Carl Ramos. I am the founder and one of the admins of the Christian Think Tank PH. I welcome you all. And also, I am to give a brief introduction about our group. The CTTPH is a movement. Well, what type of movement, you may ask? It is an online Christian apologetics movement that seeks to promote the life of the Christian mind. How do we do this? Well, we do this in various ways, in a lot of ways, one of which is hosting free, accessible lectures like this. We do this because we, we all value the role of human reason in discovering truths, in growing as a Christian, and in becoming an effective witness of the gospel to others. And lately, we have been more motivated to push this ministry forward because secularism is rising fast in the Philippines. And I honestly think, being a pastor myself, that most of our churches are not ready for this because most of them, if not all, don't want to invest time and resources in teaching apologetics to believers. That is why we exist. We are here to help equip the mind of Filipino Christians because most probably no one will, so that we can engage the intellect of secular people with the gospel message better. You see, it is time that we reclaim the Christian mind and return to the church her rightful place as the queen of philosophical thought and the king of scientific advancement. And before I give the floor to Kyle, I'd like to state a few reminders. Number one, please keep your mics muted while the lecture is ongoing. We will manually mute your mics as soon as you enter the Zoom meeting. But if you find a way to unmute yourself, please do not be tempted to do so. And don't worry, because uh, everybody will get a chance to speak during our after party. We just want to prevent distractions, especially to our speaker. Number two, we encourage everyone to ask questions. And you can send your questions to us in the Zoom chat box or if you're watching this live in Facebook, you may drop your questions in the comment section. We will try to get as much questions answered as we can. But typically due to the volume of uh, questions, we are forced to just pick one question that best represents a category. All right, and that's it for me. Kyle, please take over. Sure. Thanks a lot, Carl. We appreciate you, appreciate your time. Um, for everybody asking, I see you in the chat there, that some of you are having trouble downloading the file. Don't worry. After my introduction, I will upload it to a Google Drive, and then I'll send the link in the chat. You can just click on download it from there, okay? For those of you that can see the file, it's in the Google chat, or in the Zoom chat, sorry. So I also have the privilege of being able to introduce Dr. Blomberg, somebody whose life has actually impacted my life. I first heard about Dr. Blomberg through the book Case for Christ. This, this is one of the people that Lee Strobel interviewed when he was investigating whether what the New Testament said was actually trustworthy, whether it was historically reliable. And Dr. Blomberg's name came up. And so in the U.S., a group of friends and I, we searched around for where Dr. Blomberg was speaking, and we actually got to see him speak at an event. And let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Blomberg. Dr. Craig Blomberg completed his Ph.D. in New Testament at Aberdeen University in Scotland. He also received his master's degree, or his MA, from Trinity Evangelical Divinity School and a BA from Augustana College. Before joining the faculty at Denver Seminary, he taught at Palm Beach Atlantic College and was a research fellow in Cambridge, England with Tyndall House. In addition to writing numerous articles, probably too many to count, in professional journals, multi-author works, in dictionaries and encyclopedias, he's authored or edited 20 books, including uh, one of my favorites, The Historical Reliability of the Gospels, Can We Still Believe the Bible, and The Handbook of New Testament Exegesis. Among numerous others, Dr. Blomberg's primary research interests are New Testament, the historical trustworthiness of Scripture, hermeneutics, and exegetical method. Dr. Blomberg joined the faculty of Denver Seminary in 1986, where he is currently the Distinguished Professor of New Testament. Dr. Blomberg, we are really grateful that you decided to be here with us tonight and very early in your morning. 
So we are, we're looking forward to this. So many of us don't know how to understand the reliability of the New Testament. And so we're, we're just excited for your session here. So feel free to take it away. Well, thank you very much, uh, Kyle. And uh, yes, uh, I, I want to say good morning to you all, but I know it's good evening. Um, and uh, if uh, you are now, uh, thanks to uh, Zoom and related technology, um, simply taking for granted uh, the ability to have uh, conversations like this. Um, I am 65 years old, and so I can say that I can remember when uh, not only would this have been impossible, but um, an ordinary uh, telephone conversation from uh, one hemisphere to the other um, cost at least uh, when we were in Scotland, uh, about uh, uh, each minute what somebody might earn in about a half an hour at minimum wage. And so we didn't even have very long telephone conversations in those days. Um, we did something called write letters, which uh, really makes me look old uh, or sound old. But thank you for being here tonight. It is a, a privilege. It's uh, it's amazing technologically that we can do this, but it also means that I realize uh, I know next to nothing about uh, all of you. Um, I certainly have met many Filipinos around the world uh, as well as locally. Um, I've been privileged to travel to about 40 different countries and uh, four of them in East Asia, but sadly, the Philippines uh, so far has not been one of them. My wife has uh, been on a, a church short-term missions trip uh, to uh, just outside of Manila, but I have not yet had that privilege. And so I realize that you may have all different kinds of questions and issues. Um, and not only was I invited to talk about historical reliability, um, but not just of the Gospels, but of the uh, entire New Testament, which I also wrote a pretty big book on that was published in 2016 called Historical Reliability of the New Testament. And um, about all that we have time for is just to hit some highlights, talk about uh, some key issues and how you might think further about them. So uh, I realize that uh, at the end of uh, our time together, uh, it could be very easy to, uh, as we sometimes say in the States, feel like you're drinking out of a fire hose. Um, a whole lot of stuff will have appeared before you on the PowerPoint uh, presentation, but Kyle has that. Um, the people there are welcome to share it with any of you who want it. Um, I hope you are all able to access the, the file um, one way or the other that has been downloaded. That will be our outline that, uh, that we'll follow. Um, certainly, we'll try to get to as many questions as we can, um, but uh, Somebody will be frustrated, I know, and I apologize for that um, in advance. So I'm going to uh, share the uh, screen we'll be working with. It's almost the 4th of July in the United States, not quite. So, you know, it might be nice to have some fireworks here. Um, we're just going to go one section of the New Testament at a time and that means beginning with the first three gospels <clears throat> which are often called the synoptic gospels because you can create a, a synopsis a, a, a look at them in parallel columns uh, and see that they have much more in common with each other than uh, their differences and so um, We'll say a few things about John included in this section, 
But then we've also got a section of the, the notes devoted to John more specifically. What does a historian look for um, if you're trying to evaluate uh, the potential uh, trustworthiness of some ancient document that looks like it's written as a, a historical narrative? Um, well, two of the things uh, that you'll see there on the first line in the, the document under the Synoptic Gospels are the questions of authorship and dating. Who wrote it? Um, and how close in time were they to um, the events that, that they claim to be recording? Um, as we look at who uh, Mark and Luke and Matthew and John were, um, these were men who were in a position to know what happened. Uh, Mark uh, is... John Mark, who was the companion of the Apostle Peter and Paul, and who probably was best known for <laughs> having left Paul and another co-worker, Barnabas, on what we now call their first missionary journey in circumstances that we're not told in detail about, but apparently Paul didn't think they were legitimate. And so it, it led to... Uh, uh, an issue that was much later resolved, but um, I bring it up simply to say this is not the kind of person that the early church would have necessarily or likely have chosen if they were just making up a name uh, and saying, here's somebody who, who wrote a gospel. The same is true of Dr. Luke, um, who wrote, uh, we're told, the book of Luke, as well as the Acts of the Apostles. Um, he is referred to a couple of times at the end of a couple of Paul's letters, just in passing as uh, Paul's beloved physician, his, his well-liked doctor. And uh, we know very little more about him. Um, a fairly obscure character to pick for an author, unless he really wrote the books. Matthew was one of the 12 apostles, uh, but he was also a converted tax collector. Um, in a world where uh, that meant he was working for Rome, the uh, invading and occupying government, and therefore uh, potentially among the most unpopular of uh, the 12 that Jesus selected. Again, probably not the kind of person you would select if you just wanted to attribute um authorship to an important early Christian to try to give a, a made-up document authority. The only one who could potentially have been in that position was John, who was very close to Jesus um, and one of the inner three in the group of disciples. What about dates? Um, there certainly is a debate, and I probably should say there are debates in scholarship about those claims for authorship that we just saw, but we shouldn't exaggerate um, the significance of those debates because if not the four men that we just mentioned, then most likely somebody who was a next generation follower of one of those. Uh, and so as I put in the notes, we're still only talking about either one or two generations um, anywhere from an eyewitness to somebody two persons removed from an eyewitness well within the first century. The dates, there are debates here as well. Um, more conservative scholars will typically date Mark in the late 50s or early 60s. Matthew and Luke also in the early 60s and John to the 80s or 90s of the first century. More liberal scholars will tend to put Mark in the late 60s or early 70s, Matthew and Luke in the 80s, John in the 90s. Interesting conversation if we had more time, but the important thing again is to see that all of these uh, dates are first century dates and by ancient standards, uh, very, very close to uh, the time of the events narrated. 
look at some other ancient historical documents that uh, people seldom question and often they are written uh, two, three, four hundred years after the events that they record. But they still had to use uh, earlier sources. And so I've got a chart with the most common uh, explanation, not the only one, but the most common scholarly explanation of the relationship of the three synoptic gospels with um, Matthew and Luke, each being written a little bit later than Mark and knowing Mark and at times choosing to follow even the exact wording of Mark, uh, but then also having separate sources um, and the letters uh, simply are ways of designating that uh, Matthew has uh, a certain percentage of his text of information found only in his gospel. If he was, uh, in fact, one of the apostles, M could stand for his memory, <laughs> but it could also refer to some written or oral source or combination thereof, uh, apart from Mark. The same is true when we use the symbol L uh, to denote Luke's uh, unique material. And then once we've accounted for all of that, what's fascinating is there are about 235 verses in Matthew and Luke that are not found in Mark, um, almost all of which are sayings of Jesus. And um, as one examines uh, the Greek text that we have closely, it seems like about half of the time, Matthew may have a more literal translation from a Aramaic or Hebrew underlying uh, source, and about half the time Luke does, which means it's probably not the case that Matthew just knew Luke or Luke knew Matthew. Um, and because 19th century Germany first uh, developed this thesis where the word for source in German was Quella, uh, beginning with a Q, uh, that has come to be known as uh, Q. And if you're fans of James Bond, there's no relationship between this Q and uh, the spy that has that designation in uh, the James Bond movies. But then uh, there are other um, things that uh, the first Christians would have relied on that I've written for you there. Uh, in the ancient world, in an oral culture, where the majority of people could not read or write, things were passed on by word of mouth. And there are documented uh, abilities of people to memorize large amounts of material and pass it on very accurately. There are other documented instances of people who would memorize uh, main points and main episodes in a long epic narrative and uh, then have the freedom uh, to include or leave out, to abbreviate or to expand um, other parts of a story that was important to them, what we call flexible transmission within fixed limits. And a fascinating area of study uh, is the whole area of social memory. When a group of people knows uh, an account of its origins uh, well and frequently retells it uh, in community so that there are checks and balances if somebody uh, says something uh, wrong or, uh, or leaves out something important that others will have the freedom to, uh, to interrupt and to correct or to supplement uh, that speaker. A scholar by the name of Craig Keener teaches at Asbury Seminary in Kentucky in the US has probably done more than any other living uh, scholar to uh, show all of the, the mechanisms by which uh, writing in one form of biography known in the Greek and Roman world. Um, and then in the case of the book of Acts, writing uh, in a historical narrative, uh, just uh, all kinds of signs of uh, trustworthiness that we simply don't have time to go over here. 
But then someone says, so what about all of the differences between, especially the close parallels in Matthew, Mark, and Luke? Um, what do we do with those? Again, uh, we could spend the entire time just looking at some samples and, and seeing uh, possible solutions. But a generalization that I find very helpful in many, many instances is simply to say the ancient standards of precision were not what ours are. Um, in a world where the most accurate timekeeping device was a sundial and you didn't wear it on your wrist, um, people uh, thought in terms of quarters of the day. People didn't have quotation marks or any felt need for them. And so if you own a Bible where, where uh, as probably every version of the Bible that's been produced in the modern world has quotation marks, that's what some editor or committee has decided is the, the saying of somebody. Um, but it doesn't mean that the ancients would have thought of it as word for word um, verbatim. It means this is the gist. This is faithful to what that individual said. I find it helpful to pause at this point and look at scripture itself and what one of those gospel writers himself actually said. Um, the first four verses of the Gospel of Luke uh, talk about uh, what Luke believed he was doing. And in different language, uh, we can see an awful lot about what we've just introduced. Um, already in Luke's time, uh, Mark and Matthew may well have been written, but other shorter sources, um, and not just the ones that we've hypothesized, um, some of them oral, some of them written, were probably circulating. And Luke was aware of those. And uh, he focused on talking as somebody who was not uh, a Jew, not from Israel, not an eyewitness of Jesus' life. Uh, he focused on talking uh, with people who were. Um, and uh, a little expression there, uh, those who were eyewitnesses, but then it says servants of the word, which probably is a more specialized term than most of us realize, uh, referring to those who were authorized or certified, uh, acknowledged as people who could reliably tell the Christian story. And then Luke says uh, he didn't leave it at that. Um, he himself uh, engaged in what we would call historical investigation. He took things and put them in an order that made sense to him. Uh, for us to understand the Gospels, we have to realize that sometimes they write in chronological order, and sometimes they write in topical or thematic order, um, which accounts for the different sequences uh, along the way. But he wrote in order to help uh, a person who probably was the patron who uh, underwrote Luke's project because it would have cost something uh, and probably was a, a high class person because Luke refers to him as most excellent Theophilus. Um, was he a new Christian or someone inquiring into the Christian faith? We're not sure, but either way, Luke wants him to know uh, with a greater degree of certainty or assurance the things that he has started to learn about. All of this reinforces the idea that uh, the Gospels were written with a, a historical intent in mind. Um, someone will ask, well, what about sources outside the New Testament? What about sources uh, that aren't even Christian um, from the ancient world. And you can find all kinds of made up things on the internet. I assume everybody knows that by now. Don't believe something just because you read it. 
um, including me. Check it out. Um, but uh, you'll find uh, bloggers who say there, there's no ancient non-Christian testimony about Jesus. And um, maybe some of them really don't know. I think most of them are deliberately lying from my experience. Uh, they know better. But uh, there are two key references in the first century, Jewish historian Josephus. Um, in the oral traditions that were much later written down in the Jewish document, the Talmud, another half a dozen, uh, there are Greek and Roman writers whose names probably are unfamiliar to most of us. But if we combine the information that appears in these sources, um, we can uh, read, not looking at one Christian writer anywhere, that there was a Jewish man by the name of Jesus who lived in the first third of the first century in Israel, uh, who was born out of wedlock, who um, as a young adult gathered followers and uh, functioned like a Jewish rabbi would, um, though there's no evidence of him having any formal credentials, that his teachings about the law regularly brought him into conflict with uh, Jewish authorities, that his ministry intersected with uh, another Jewish man who had been baptizing people for the forgiveness of sins, whose name was John, and that uh, Eventually, uh, he ran afoul of the authorities enough that he was uh, crucified, um, executed in a gruesome fashion under the uh, Roman governor in Judea, Pontius Pilate. Yet, despite that end, uh, his followers continued to believe in him as Messiah and uh, believe that he worked miracles, including being raised from the dead, and began to meet on a regular and eventually weekly basis, um, including singing hymns to him as if he were a god. Uh, actually, a, a remarkable amount of information in the ancient world, um, given that Jesus was not the kind of person that historians wrote about because he wasn't royalty, he wasn't um, a rich person, he wasn't in any official position of leadership or notoriety um, in his society. But then we have to pass to the Gospel of John. And we have to say, if I read John right after reading the other three Gospels, it's very clear that about 80% of what he includes is different information. Why is he so different? And the scholarly pendulum has swung in different directions here, but today uh, a fair consensus has arrived at the view that um, he certainly, writing last and latest of the four, would have been aware of what. Uh, the contents of the other Gospels were, but was not in some kind of literary relationship the way Matthew, Mark, and Luke were with each other. He didn't have a copy of the scroll in front of him at any point uh, when he wrote his Gospel uh, so that there would be uh, noticeable sections uh, that were word for word the same as something in a, a preceding Gospel. Um, he was a, a very unique writer. Um, he wrote, early church uh, information says, to Christians in and around Ephesus um, in what we would call Western Turkey <laughs> at the end of the first century when Roman persecution was beginning to be a key issue, when uh, threats from uh, a Greek uh, philosophical combination of Christian and pagan ideas known as Gnosticism uh, began to uh, infiltrate the church and uh, 
people who believe that yes jesus may well have been god but god can't really become human was a, a major challenge um and a time when jews were increasingly excommunicating their members who became followers of jesus uh, a set of circumstances that led in part to a, a different selection of the uh, testimony about jesus he also wrote everything up in his very own unique style and yet one of the fascinating things if you know the first three gospels well or can get a hold of a, a study bible that has a lot of cross references very few sections of john are completely lacking in some short parallel if not in wording then certainly in content to something that you can find in matthew mark or luke they are more similar than first meets the eye take just as one example almost randomly all of the famous i am sayings in john's gospel um, only john has jesus saying i am the bread of life or the resurrection and the life or the way the truth and the life or the um gate for the sheep um the uh, true vine and so on and yet the language in those imagery can be found in the synoptics and some rather remarkable i am sayings in matthew mark and luke as well including uh, when jesus is walking on the water and the disciples are terrified and he says fear not literally i am which may be a reference back just like John's reference to before Abraham was I am uh, refers back to the language of God at the burning bush in Exodus 3 uh, when God reveals his name as the great I am. There is a, a passage in both uh, Matthew and Luke, um, and I've gotten ahead of myself here slightly, um, that uh, um, sounds very much like John uh, in we'll come to that in uh, in just a moment here is a slide and uh, I had a student once who say this looks like something out of the matrix but uh, if you're familiar with those films if I put it all together um, it uh, it looks like uh, a bizarre chart and I'm not gonna walk through all the pieces of it. Um, but there is reason to think that if we start from the eyewitness experience of the apostle John during the ministry of Jesus, the common forms of the kerygma, the preached gospel, kerygma simply means proclamation, different sources that John may have used unique to him, uh, a common reflection in apostolic circles and in John's community about what was important to them, and possibly even uh, an initial and then a final edited touch up of John after his death, which might account for the strange ending of John, where people are asking about. Didn't Jesus say he was going to live till he returned? No, that's just what some people thought. Um, a complex system of uh, things of this nature may all go into the unique uh, formation and composition of John. But here's the, the passage. There's a close parallel in Luke as well that has been called in some circles uh a thunderbolt from the sky uh coming straight out of the gospel of john this kind of wording all things have been committed to me by my father and the son father language no one knows the son except the father 
No one knows the Father except the Son. And then this language of special revelation, those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. That sounds so much like Jesus in so many of his uh, speeches or discourses in the Gospel of John, and yet it's in the Synoptics, which is just a reminder that Jesus did so much more and said so much more and probably used so many more styles and forms of instruction than just the little bit that has been revealed to us in the four Gospels, which is actually what John himself says near the end of his Gospel, when he says, <clears throat> a little bit of exaggeration, the whole world couldn't contain the books that could be written if we talked about everything that Jesus said and did, but these things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and believing have life in his name. We could take the time, and again, um, I am going to simply go through a series of slides. You can take them away. Um, you can get a hold of my book or others like it that give this information. You'll see on the uh, the handout, the file that's been posted, um, all kinds of references to good, recent, detailed scholarship uh, if you want more information on all of these. But archaeology, and it's interesting, the vast majority of the spectacular archaeological discoveries have specific bearing on details in John's Gospel. Um, I've just selected a, a handful of things here. Uh, the two pools of Bethesda and Siloam, uh, and, and research continues to go on even as we speak. You can go to Jerusalem. You can see the excavation of these pools. They were probably ritual immersion pools on a giant scale, um, Olympic-sized swimming pools or bigger. Um, both in the north and the south of the temple precincts to help people purify themselves uh, en route to uh, worshiping in the temple. How could the book of Acts say that 3,000 people were baptized on one day? Simple. They did more than that on one day as people were coming for every Passover in uh, these immersion pools. And we won't take the time to to talk through all of the other items on this slide. If we move to the Acts of the Apostles, um, now we move into a very different realm where we're not looking at the tiny little country of Israel down in the middle and lower right-hand corner of this map. We're looking at a wide swath of territory, and this map doesn't even include Rome. You can see the very tip of Italy in the far left-hand upper corner. Um, I picked it uh, simply because uh, it's one of the clearer and less cluttered maps that you can download legally from uh, the internet. Uh, it happens to be a Paul's third missionary journey, but the purpose of, of putting it here is just to show there are cities, there are provinces, there are islands. One of them is misspelled. Cyprus should be C-Y-P-R-U-S. Um, that kind of Cyprus is a tree. Um, there are bodies of water. Um, there are even roads that are mentioned in the book of Acts every single one of which has been discovered, including some in less than the last hundred years that people for a long time weren't sure if they were genuine places or not. We can do the same kind of thing with the names of people. Here's a not so trivial Bible trivia quiz for those of you who are longtime Christians. Uh, could you identify 
uh, without looking, without looking up. Uh, who all these people are, they all appear by name in the book of Acts. And I just picked the most famous ones. Um, here are, here's a list of different categories of leaders. Some of them Jewish, like the Jewish high court, the Sanhedrin. The Italian regiment, the name of a cohort of Roman soldiers. And most of the rest um, are simply individuals or groups of people uh, who were in some form of leadership unique to a specific city or province, not necessarily used in neighboring cities or provinces. And Luke gets every one of them right. This is not what you find when you read Homer's Iliad and the Odyssey. This is not what you find when you read Old Testament apocryphal books like Judith or Tobit. Um, this is not what you find when you read first century Greek or Roman romances. Oh, you may find a few places and a few people that are accurate, but most of it is demonstrably fictitious. There are all kinds of other lists and charts. And again, uh, I know I'm going too fast for you to take notes. Um, that's deliberate. Um, I'm trying to simply create the impression that, uh, well, here's another one. From non-Christian sources only, I can come up with all of the dates of the events in the book of Acts within a year or two of what we see on the slide. And then based on information in Acts, because Acts gives a lot of detail of time that elapses in different places, I can begin to fill in other information um, and come up with a, a very credible chronology of the book of Acts. Not everyone agrees with it. There are reasons for questioning individual dates, but a fair consensus of scholars who have specialized in this topic. The point of the slide is just to say, pick for me any novel that you can find in the ancient Jewish, Greek, or Roman world even if there are some historical trappings in it, and you cannot create, even just using the document itself, much less looking to information elsewhere, you cannot create um, a list of information in this kind of detail to uh, show that the writer is attempting to write um, accurate history. You may not have seen, you may have seen a, a chart like the last one someplace. You may not have seen uh, key events in the, the life of Jesus. I don't know why introductory textbooks don't tend to do something like this as often. Um, but from the Gospels and Acts and the Epistles of Paul, um, we can together compile a plausible uh, brief outline of the life of Saul of Tarsus up to when he begins uh, the part of his ministry that Luke records in more detail. Um, you cannot do that with the characters in Homer. Um, you cannot do that with the uh, apocryphal accounts of uh, even Christian later uh, accounts of uh, the doings of Jesus or the apostles. Uh, there's just not that kind of information supplied to uh, make compiling such a chart possible. That's one of the ways to distinguish um, novels 
from historical writing. What about Paul's letters? People have read the book of Acts and said, isn't it remarkable that there's not a word in Acts about the fact that Paul ever wrote any letters? Interesting observation. I don't know entirely what to make of it other than Luke seems more interested in telling where Paul went and what he did at each place. And yet, from Acts and from the incidental autobiographical reflections in Paul's letters, Paul never sets out in Romans to say, now, by the way, guys, here are the churches I've been to before. This is the order. This is how long I stayed at each place. Um, there's the occasional reference back to what happened at some other source. But the letters are all about helping solve theological and practical problems in the early church. And yet I can put together a chart. There's some questions. There are a few disputes, uh, particularly with the data Galatians. Um, but the mere fact that I can create a chart of this nature uh, sets off Acts and the letters uh, from other superficially similar collections of works. If we then turn from the Gospels and Acts to the rest of the New Testament, now the issues become uh, of a different kind. Um, what what is there to say about historical reliability behind uh, the letter to Philemon on freeing a runaway slave? <laughs> well, one of the issues uh, has to do with whether, in the case of Paul, um, he actually wrote all of the letters attributed to him. We can break them into probably three categories of undisputed letters, of those that some scholars, uh, a significant group of scholars, but certainly not all, uh, dispute. And then those that outside of more conservative or evangelical circles are uh, very widely disputed. Um, should we be concerned about this? Was it the practice in um, the Mediterranean world in the first century to write in the name of somebody else? Today, we tend to call that forgery, and that immediately has a, a sound of, of someone being intentionally uh, deceptive. Well, it's fascinating if we uh, go back to ancient Jewish and Greek and Roman uh, conventions. Um, if I look at the 400 plus year period between the Old and New Testament, uh, there were a lot of documents, including some found in uh, the Old Testament Apocrypha, uh, but many others as well, that uh, were attributed to ancient heroes in Israelite history, um, Abraham, Moses, Solomon, uh, the 12 sons of Jacob, and yet as far as we can tell, no one believed uh, that these documents emerging usually in about the second or first century BC were some spectacular discoveries from millennia earlier. It was an understood literary convention to write something in the spirit or in the name of a famous person. Um, <clears throat> in a world without uh, footnotes, almost as a way of attributing some of one's own thoughts or inspiration to uh, 
the writings of a, a venerated ancestor. If I, oh, sorry, went the wrong way. If I turn to early Christian testimony, the sources that we have are no earlier than about 150 AD. Most of them are very late second or third century sources. They're not Jewish, they're Gentile Christian sources. But without exception, if a document was discovered not to have been written by someone who claimed to have written it, it was rejected. So what happened in between? Was it that Jews continued to accept this? It doesn't appear that way. Was it that Gentiles once accepted it and then changed their mind? We just don't have enough evidence to be sure. Um, I don't have the time to build a lot of suspense here for what's in the middle of the chart, other than to let us all down and say, we just don't know. We just don't have any um, writing to suggest from about the middle of the first century BC to the middle of the second century AD what people's attitudes were, who changed when. Um, there certainly are examples of duplicitous forgery, but there also are examples of what seems to be um, innocuous. Um, I am writing to you what I believe my teacher would have said if he were still alive type of, of work. And so, um, important, interesting conversations, but I wouldn't ever want to lose my faith over something like that. Uh, it just doesn't rise to that high of a level. The other issue that's fascinating out of the letters of Paul has to do with, um, on the one hand, he doesn't seem to quote Jesus very often. Why not, if Jesus was his Lord and Savior? Well, most of his letters were written in the 50s before there were any written gospels. But what he does do in a number of interesting places is, if not quote, at least allude to language that we can find in the gospels on topics like divorce and remarriage, on topics like accepting money for ministry or um, accepting bed and board, uh, lodging, food, um, which interestingly, the average Jewish rabbi uh, was not allowed to do. We can find, uh, at least in one case, a uh, fairly long quotation or allusion in 1 Corinthians 11 to language in the Synoptic Gospels, especially in Luke, about what happened on the night of the Last Supper. Um, we can find uh, allusions to details about what Jesus taught about his second coming, including the very striking metaphor that it would be like a thief coming in the night. Well, that's a negative image. <laughs> a brand new Christian reading that probably might think, oh, what's Jesus going to steal? <laughs> no, that's not the idea, but uh, something surprising and unexpected that people are unprepared for. That's such a potentially unflattering uh, thing to say about Jesus that probably nobody would have made it up uh, if Jesus hadn't said it. And Paul apparently knows about it. Um, very difficult language <laughs> to obey. Christians haven't done it well, and they still aren't doing it well about loving enemies. My goodness. Um, doing good to those who harm you, blessing those who curse you. 
when we look through Paul's letters more carefully, we discover he probably does know a lot more than first meets the eye from the oral tradition that was circulating, that was passing on the teaching of Jesus. We can see that at a conceptual level as well. Key themes in Paul, justification by faith, the righteousness of God being revealed by faith from uh, from first to last, Romans 1, 17. And the law as fulfilled in Jesus. Uh, the double love command to love God and neighbor as ourselves. Uh, consistently countercultural uh, roles uh, for women, even though, and I think I've got the titles reversed here, I just realized. Uh, that should say at the bottom of the screen, even though no unequivocal examples of women as uh, elders or the the highest uh, level of uh, teaching authority in the church. Go to Jesus, and he may only rarely use the term justification, but on four different times in different gospels, he tells somebody he is healed. Your faith has saved you and there's reason to suggest that it's spiritual as well as physical healing he says in the sermon on the mount um that we are to pray your will be done your kingdom come your will be done as if that defines part of what god's kingdom coming means and he goes on to say seek first the kingdom of god and his righteousness apparently those are interrelated they're not separate topics even though jesus does talk about kingdom a whole lot more than paul does and paul talks about righteousness a whole lot more than the kingdom the law of christ um matthew 5 17 uh the double love command um and here <laughs> this should say uh, countercultural role for women, despite um, no women apostles. Sorry about confusing those two columns there. Um, not commenting on, even beginning to comment on the issue of what that means for today, but just at the level of the first century. The list could be extended uh, in some detail. David Wenham's book that I list on the uh, the file um goes into a lot of of additional detail there the rest of the new testament the issues shrink in number uh they continue to surround uh issues of authorship which we don't have to go into a lot of detail on um hebrews is the one letter uh, that at least in the original manuscripts had no claim of authorship attached to it. And people have debated, was it uh, by Paul or from a, a follower of Paul? Um, that doesn't have to rise to the same level of, of issue as some of these others. James has the very famous supposed contradiction with Paul. Is it faith that saves you or is it faith without works is dead? And yet once we realize that for James, the kind of faith that has to be supplemented by works is the faith that says, I believe in one God, James 2.19. But I do nothing to help even the neediest of my fellow believers. It's Jewish monotheism, whereas Paul, when he talks about faith, it's faith in Jesus. Similarly, when James talks about the works that have to demonstrate the reality of faith, he's talking about deeds of Christian mercy. Whereas when Paul uh, adamantly, especially in Galatians and Romans, talks about uh, no one will be saved by the works of the law, he is talking about the laws of Moses. Both writers 
actually are in agreement. Galatians 5, 6, which is Paul, uh, explicitly talks about faith working, working through love as that which matters rather than either circumcision or uncircumcision. I got a couple of these slides reversed. Sorry about that. Who wrote Hebrews? All kinds of options. The first column are ancient suggestions. The second column are more modern ones. Um, what's interesting is the ancient ones are all people who had some contact with Paul, even if they, uh, they weren't Paul himself. But um, that doesn't have to be. Uh, the same kind of issue. First Peter and Second Peter, very different from each other in style. What's going on there? If Peter wrote both of them. Well, Peter in First Peter says he may have used a scribe as people conventionally did. Maybe it was Silas. Second Peter suggests that Peter's martyrdom is very close. And that he may have realized he wouldn't live to finish writing this letter. And that someone following him may have written it up in its final form. We don't know either of these for sure. But it may help explain some of what's going on. The little letter of Jude. What could there possibly be to question about Jude? <laughs> Has a number of. Uh, references, especially the metaphors that um, are used to describe the false teachers in Jude's communities. And uh, my goodness, uh, one parallel after another to Second Peter chapter 2. There's a literary relationship here. What's wrong with that? One early Christian writer discovering that another one is already written um, and used a, a great set of, uh, of comparisons. I realize that um, I am within a couple of minutes of my hour's limit and uh, there are more topics here and maybe somebody wants to ask about them in our Q&A time. So let me just uh, tantalize you and frustrate you simultaneously. Um, what about all the so-called Gnostic literature and Gnostic gospels that people are talking about today? Well, here are my answers. I don't have time to go over them, but uh, you can read about them in the book. What about the books written after the New Testament that have all kinds of fanciful apocryphal stories about Jesus and the apostles. Well, here are my answers. <laughs> and I don't have time to go through them, but maybe you want to come back uh, and ask about them. What's the real story about how the text of the New Testament was transmitted? There's only two big textual variants, only a couple dozen decent sized ones. And we have so many manuscripts available, we can figure out what's original and what's not. <coughs> and even in the handful where there's some dispute, nothing that matters for Christian faith depends on any disputed text. How did the canon come into existence? It was not anything that Constantine created. It had nothing to do with the Council of Nicaea. It was a slow process that began already in the early second century. And there weren't any debates over 20 of the 27 books, including the ones most of us know best. You don't always know that from the web. And there were criteria that were followed. What about miracles and all the so-called ancient parallels to them? Well, 
Most of them aren't all that close. They're about gods that died and rose every year, according to the seasons. Or if they are close, they're written later, after Christianity. They can't have been the source for Christianity. <coughs> no known claims of bodily resurrections of people known to have been real humans living recently. So my conclusion. Is faith rational? We all have to take a, a step of faith, or some would call it a leap of faith. Does it, as I've tried to think of an analogy based on the long jump in uh, athletics, um, is it like somebody running down the track, the direction the evidence is pointing them, and then screeching to a halt and trying to throw themselves backwards in the opposite direction um a backwards lung jump uh faith despite all the evidence is it like a, a standing jump where i don't run at all i just go up to the line and see how far i can jump or is it something where the evidence actually propels us in the direction that we want to jump and therefore makes it a, a shorter, easier jump. I would argue that it's the last of those three. I apologize for taking a couple of extra minutes. I'll stop there and turn it over to my hosts. All right. Thank you for that, Dr. Blomberg. And we appreciate so much the time of lecture. And it's totally fine that, uh, as you said, you exceed in the time, but it's totally fine because we're, you already covered some of the questions there, especially given uh, about the, the canonicity of the New Testament. But we do have several questions. And I uh, just want to inform everyone that, as Carl said, we have to categorize questions so that we can uh, limit the time and limit the questions because we respect everyone's time especially that it's a Sunday evening here in the Philippines. So let us let me start with this. How can we fully trust uh, the New Testament? Let's, let's, let's take it for granted that, that um, the New Testament is reliable. But how can we trust it in terms of its theological content and as well as the exact words that were written uh, in the original autographs, since there are copies of copies? And why do you think God didn't preserve the original manuscripts in the first place? Yeah. Great questions. Um, it's interesting. It's interesting at this point to compare with some of the claims of, of Muslim friends and the Quran. Um, it seems that the early church was much more committed to getting the word out, to disseminating uh, the gospel message and the written documents that came to be called uh, the New Testament and to translate them into numerous other languages in the ancient world <clears throat> and that that trumped the desire to so meticulously copy every word and every letter that uh, there never were any changes um i find it interesting uh as i have studied islam and talked with muslims that it is possible to memorize large parts of the quran maybe even all of it and to recite it in arabic and not have a clue what a single word means because arabic is not my language and yet that is considered meritorious and noble i don't think any christian has ever imagined such a concept what would be the point if you had no idea what the words meant what's important is understanding and therefore what facilitates that means translation and translation how do you translate one language to another i assume everybody watching this video except me speaks at least one filipino language and english and maybe others and you know you can't translate literally many many times there are multiple ways to translate 
So how could things have been preserved word for word if tr translation was the priority? Um, yeah, lots of other things in, in that question um, that we touched on ever so briefly, but I think those were, were the, the key new pieces. And, and I'll try to be brief so you can ask a whole bunch of things yeah. here. So yeah, we also try to make it the questions simplified or questions here are even combined. Right. right. And uh, yeah, thanks for that. Uh, so let me proceed with the, another one. Then since you just yeah. tried to uh, summarize the part of the canonicity, maybe this is a time where you can expound about it. And it's sure. about uh, the compilation. How the New Testament was compiled in the first place. Uh, was it historically treated like each book was treated with authority already? And how about those that are called the lost gospels and the yeah. apocrypha and gospels of Thomas and Mary Magdalene and all of this stuff? It seems what? like they emerged in chunks. Yes, each each book would have originally been written to a person or a church. Um, and often we know what those were, like with Paul's letters. But it seems like a, a collection of the gospels began to emerge and a collection of Paul's letters. Um, and Fairly early on, uh, the book of Acts was treated separately from Luke's gospel, and those circulated. Some of the earliest collections put Acts where we know it, between the gospels and the letters. Some of them put Acts after the letters of Paul, if you want to relate to Paul. What about Hebrews, the problem of, of who wrote it? And Hebrews was not always put in the same place. Um, the other letters that are attributed to people other than, than Paul probably began to circulate as a collection. Um, and the testimony that we have, if we had had the time to go through it <clears throat> pretty quickly, uh, 20 of the 27 books were just accepted as these came from apostles or followers of apostles. They have the ring of truth. They have an authoritative, uh, relevant function widely in the early church. Um, they do not contradict uh, the Old Testament, but they show Christianity as the fulfillment of Judaism. And the books that there was any discussion about tended to be the really short ones, <laughs> Second John, Third John, Jude. Um, are they really that relevant? Um, a book like Revelation, which has always been mysterious in how to interpret it for people. A book like James, because of the problem we discussed of James versus Paul. A book like Hebrews, because of the authorship question. Or Second Peter, because it was so different from First Peter. Those were the main discussions um, that people had. Um, the other later Gnostic Gospels were hardly ever put forward by anybody. And what's fascinating to me is that not even the Gnostics who supported them, we have no indication in any existing document that they treated their works as on the same level as the other 27 books. Maybe they did, but if so, we don't know that. Um, it's really only been modern scholars who have said, oh, yeah, let's consider some of the Gnostic Gospels because some of the theology is very compelling to the, the modern skeptic where you find God within, you find the spark of divinity within every human being waiting to be fanned into flame. There is not uh, an authority authoritative magisterium that puts limits on what you should believe or not believe or behave ethically or not behave. Um, that just, that's really a modern invention to say things overly simplistically of people who wish these could have been their authorities. And so they decide to make them so. All right. So uh, speaking of Revelation, this is just a personal question for me, and it's very tangential. When do you think was the book of Revelations uh, written? 
probably in the 90s under uh, the reign of Domitian when there was um, a brief uh, but in certain places intense persecution of the church. And um, John is in exile on the uh, penal colony island of Patmos and gets these amazing revelations that he sends back to the mainland. Um, but they are all given to him in imagery that would communicate to first century people, first century Christians. Um, the worst thing you can do in interpreting the book of Revelation is forget the historical background and say, well, let's speculate about what things in today's world might correspond to X, Y, and, and Z. Um, the first thing you have to do is to say, what would Christians living in Asia Minor at the end of the first century, how could they have made sense of this imagery? Exactly. Like, especially in the Old Testament, how we try to read those stuff. That's right. it's, it's, it's much uh, more That's right. uh, in the past. So uh, another question here is about the differences among the Gospels, yeah. since you already talked about it earlier, especially from the atheists or the skeptics. This is often where they try to attack saying that the bible has contradictions but can you expound more on that you think uh differences would necessarily point to contradiction and just to add how do you explain these differences in light of the doctrine of in inerrancy and another right. side note another side note uh do you think these differences are lapses from memorization from the no. process of the events by the authors no i think they're very deliberate uh ways to write up accounts in different lengths, different amounts of detail, selecting different portions of events. And um, to have a viable doctrine of inerrancy, what we are saying is that the works of scripture do not have errors, at which point somebody should say, well, how do you define an error? And again, the only legitimate and fair way to do that is to say, what would somebody in the time of the book of the Bible that we're discussing have defined an error? To use just one somewhat trivial example, um, you gentlemen were incredibly prompt in starting this show. I've been on podcasts in the US or Zoom sessions where a starting time of nine o'clock meant 10 after nine. Um, is that an error? No, it's just that in a certain subculture, that's what you mean. You don't hold to the time frame that tightly. Um, what does it mean to say, and immediately Jesus did such and such? When you look at a parallel gospel and it was three months later, well, immediately in the ancient world often meant, and now the next most important thing I wanna tell you that happened is, well, we don't use language like that, but they did. So that doesn't solve all the problems, but uh, degrees of precision really does solve uh, a huge number of them. The others, you just, pretty much have to go one at a time. Um, and, and it's hard to generalize uh, other than to say, give me an example of what you're thinking about and I'll give you my best shot at how I deal with that one. Hmm. Which the book goes into great detail on. <laughs> yeah, so like the audience is, is a big factor in how the gospel is written. Absolutely. Like, what, is, what is most relevant to them? Absolutely. Or, yeah, that's wonderful. and. Um, yeah, that, that just struck me. Thank you for that. So let me proceed here. Here's a, another question. Uh, what are your thoughts about what James Dunn, uh, James Dunn's statement about the gospel? The four gospels were just an interpretation of the writers with the actual words of Jesus Christ. So I think this question is about uh, what do you think about the extended words there, especially uh, the epistles with Paul? I have seen you contrasted the, the, what the doctrine of Jesus would taught and, and Pauline. Uh, and there are there are really uh, similarities, and in fact, very similar. Do you think there are added theological content 
uh, with the writers apart from what Jesus just literally said? Oh, sure. Uh, otherwise, there'd be no point to have uh, anything in the New Testament beyond the four Gospels. Um, if, if nothing had changed from the Old Testament, there'd be no point in having even the four Gospels. If nothing had changed from the five books of Moses, there'd be no need to have the Old Testament beyond Genesis through Deuteronomy. Every stage, every section of the development of Scripture is what theologians often call progressive revelation. Um, God recognized that at certain times in history, um, certain amounts of information, certain accounts of historical events were what uh, his people needed. And over time, this continually gets supplemented um, until it comes to a close with the, the end of the book of Revelation. Um, so yes, there are, there are plenty of topics. Um, what, what should Christians do when it comes to lawsuits? You can't find a word in the Old Testament or the Gospels or the book of Acts on the topic. First Corinthians will tell you, you are not to sue fellow Christians. Well, isn't that interesting? There are an awful lot of people, at least in my country, who seem never to have read that. <laughs> There's a case in ours as well. I thought it might be. Um, there's another question here, Dr. Blomberg. Uh, do you think the New Testament fits into the genre of ancient biography, similar to Mike Lekona's or Craig Kinner's view? Uh, and won't this, won't this uh, boost the New Testament's reliability? No, because uh, the people who, who criticize that um, need to go back and, and read uh, Keener and Lekona more carefully. Yes, there are forms of Greek and Roman history and biography that were not terribly well done. And there were others that were quite well done. And nobody says that um, one couldn't do uh, writing in the style of Greek or Roman biography even better than anyone whose works have survived had done. Um, it's kind of like... Uh, I don't know if this is a good analogy. I've never thought of it before. It's off the top of my head, but I am taking, uh, I'm, I'm writing essays for a final exam at the end of a course of study. And uh, somebody says, um, you're going to write an essay on, pick a topic, uh, the history of uh, commerce between Brazil and the Philippines a couple hundred years ago. Oh, you don't want to go into that topic. No, no. Everybody who's done it so far, they've, they've had some problems. Well, well, what do you mean? Well, they just haven't always been accurate. So, so I shouldn't research the topic? What's to say I can't do an accurate job? Um, so I think people are mixing apples and oranges when, when they do that. So thank, thanks for that. Um, maybe one of near end questions for the question and response portion. Um, you said earlier about accuracy. Uh, you mentioned that in the early parts of the lecture. So if accuracy wasn't important, uh, why were scribes punished so harshly if they made even one error in copying of the Old Testament? So I think this is referring to the Old Testament's culture of scribes and manuscript copying. That was not standard practice. There are a few stories of fairly aberrant examples. Qumran, which was an extremist movement uh, on the shores of the Dead Sea. It is remarkable if you compare the Hebrew texts of parts of the Old Testament over the centuries. Um, especially by the time you get up to what's called the Masoretic text um, in the 600 AD and following. But there are still textual variants. You can see the most significant ones in any modern language Old Testament if you look at the footnotes. And those scribes were not punished. 
Um, people did the best they could. They did meticulous checking and double checking and triple checking, but errors still came through. Um, that's sort of one of those things like saying, well, what do you think about Christians censoring the Gnostic literature and burning it? Yeah, that happened twice <laughs> in, in remote places. Um, that was not the norm. Um, yeah, don't get hung up over that. So I think this is more of a personal one. So you have written a lot of books. And in this specific topic, what book would you highly recommend? The ones that you've written, especially uh, the ones about this. I have written. Um, yeah. If you're just interested in the Gospels, then uh, it's cheaper and it's shorter um, by the historical reliability of the Gospels. If you're interested in some of the things we talked about in Acts through Revelation, um, then the larger one, the historical reliability of the New Testament is is probably the the better one. Um, and I apologize that it costs so much. I, I don't have anything to do with, with pricing. <laughs> it is totally fine. I think it, it, it is worth it. Yeah. Thank you. So I think everything you said were, were interesting. And I, I think everyone should be interested in it, especially for Christians. We should, and as the CTT says, like we should take interest in this, these things if we truly are serious with our faith. And in evangelizing the, and discipleship, especially in apologetics. So these things are very important. And just, just maybe for a, a side question or a tangential one, someone is asking, how would you explain about the mass resurrection uh, event in the New Testament, uh, in the Gospel of Matthew specifically? Like the mass oh, resurrection. Oh, my, yes. Uh, Matthew 27, 51 to 53, after Jesus' resurrection. A few selected saints, apparently Old Testament believers, uh, came out of the tombs, went into the holy city, and appeared to many. <laughs> Next topic. <laughs> and, and we read that and we go, excuse me, what just happened? Who got raised? Um, how long did they stay visible? Who did they appear to? How many people saw them? Mm -hmm. what, what's going on there? Well, I think. Paul gives us the one clue, and probably the only one that we need. Um, when he writes in 1 Corinthians 15 that Christ is the first fruits of the resurrection of all believers. Whatever else may have been going on there, um, Matthew wanted us to know. And if Matthew's writing in the early 60s, Paul's already written 1 Corinthians in 55 or thereabouts. Um, Matthew wants us to know that because of Jesus' resurrection, every follower of the God of Jesus Christ, Old Testament, New Testament, anywhere in the world who has ever lived, or ever will live, can look forward to resurrection life, not just die and go to heaven. Um, that's just the beginning of the story, but anticipate new heavens and new earth, the end of the book of Revelation, an eternity of renewed relationships with all our Christian brothers and sisters and people we've never met. It'll take us an eternity to enjoy God and all of our brothers and sisters in the Lord. Um, that's the exciting part. Um, Very exciting. Beyond that, beats me. <laughs> um, thank you for that. Um, maybe this one is like an additional a question. It's 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 from me. And last uh, two weeks ago, we had a topic from Dr. Averbeck about the Old Testament's yeah. reliability, and they were having the New Testament. Do you think the reliability of the Old Testament confirms the, uh, I mean like this, do you think the reliability of the New Testament would confirm the reliability of the Old Testament, in a sense, or, or do they have a relationship with each other? The reliability it's, of one... That's a fascinating animates. question. 
Um, indirectly, yes. I mean, not directly. To say that Luke was a reliable historian tells me nothing about whether certain things happened that First Samuel tells us about. On the other hand, all of the Gospels portray Jesus himself as having a very exalted view of his scripture, the Hebrew scripture, which we now call the Old Testament. Um, John 10 quotes uh, Jesus saying, scripture cannot be broken. You can't leave out any single part of it. Um, and so uh, in that way, if Luke has accurately, if Matthew and Mark and John have accurately talked about what Jesus taught and believed, then that includes a degree of reliability of the Old Testament, very much so. So there are a lot, of, I think there are a lot of questions, especially from the live stream uh, that they weren't asked because I, I felt like they were redundant, maybe no longer relevant for, for the greater topic as a whole. By the way, uh, we have a YouTube channel. <laughs> and for the, since, since I mentioned about Dr. Averbeck, we do have the video there. So just last one, uh, and it's, it's no longer about the topic, but how people can reach to you. That's a, and, we, and thank you, Dr. Blomberg. Thank you for responding to all those questions and we truly You're love welcome. it. And, and thank you. It was thank wonderful. you for having me.